Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Even today, the law forbids entry to anyone who has been a, quote, member of or affiliated with the communist or any other totalitarian party, end quote. Meanwhile, the government cannot discriminate against U.S. citizens who share those same views, including by denying them government services available to others. Similar constitutional double standards pervade many other aspects of immigration policy. Courts have ruled that the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment provides for paid counsel in most cases where the state threatens indigent individuals with severe deprivations of liberty. But indigent migrants targeted for detention and deportation are not entitled to free legal representation and often have to navigate a complex legal system without assistance. This leads to such horrific absurdities excuse me. This leads to such horrific absurdities as toddlers representing themselves in deportation proceedings. You don't have to be a lawyer to recognize that this does not comport with the due process of law required by the Fifth Amendment. Some argue that nothing is wrong with such policies because immigrants have no constitutional right to enter the United States. But the Constitution undeniably prohibits various types of dis discrimination with respect to issues that are not themselves constitutional rights. For example, there is no constitutional right to receive Social Security benefits, but it would still be unconstitutional for the federal government to adopt a policy that extended such benefits only to Christians or only to people who support the president. Non-citizens are not categorically denied all constitutional rights, far from it. If they are accused of a crime, they get the same procedural rights as citizens. If the government condemns their property, they are entitled to just compensation under the Fifth Amendment. Many other constitutional rights cover them as well, but the anti-immigrant double standard applies to virtually all laws and regulations governing entry into the United States, immigration detention, and deportation. Immigrants are not the only ones who suffer as a result of the immigration law double standard. Many native-born citizens suffer along with them. A study by the Northwestern University political science professor Jacqueline Stevens estimates that the federal government detained or deported some 4,000 American citizens in 2010 alone, and more than 20,000 from 2003 to 2010, due to mistakes resulting from the extremely lax procedural safeguards surrounding immigration detention and deportation. Other American citizen victims of the immigration double standard include the thousands of parents forcibly separated from their children and vice versa by measures such as Trump's travel ban, which would have been invalidated as unconstitutional if not for special judicial deference on immigration policy. Many U.S. citizens also suffer from the extensive racial profiling permitted in immigration enforcement. There is no basis for the immigration double standard in the text and original meaning of the Constitution. Most constitutional rights are phrased as generalized limitations on government power, not privileges that only apply to specific groups of people, such as U.S. citizens, or to government actions in specific places, such as U.S. territory. The First Amendment, for instance, states that Congress shall make no law restricting freedom of speech and religion, not Congress shall make no law except when it comes to immigration restricting those rights. A few constitutional rights are indeed limited to U.S. citizens or to, quote, the people, as in the case of the Second Amendment, right to bear arms, which might be interpreted as a synonym for citizens. But the fact that a few rights are specifically reserved for citizens highlights the broader principle that most are not. There would be no need to specify such restrictions if the default assumption were that all rights are limited to citizens. The inference from the text is backed by founding era practice. During that period, it was assumed that even suspected pirates captured at sea, whether U.S. citizens or not, were protected by the Bill of Rights and therefore entitled to the due process of law guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment. 
immigrants surely deserve at least as much protection as alleged pirates. Hard to argue with that. During the founding era, the dominant view held by founding fathers, including Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, the father of the Constitution, was that the federal government did not even have a general power to restrict immigration. The Supreme Court did not decide that Congress had a general power over immigration until the Chinese exclusion case of 1889, a ruling heavily influenced by racial prejudice. It is perverse that the exercise of federal power that rests on such dubious foundations is largely exempt from the judicial scrutiny. Let me try that again. <clears throat> largely exempt from the judicial scrutiny that applies to almost all other powers. Admittedly, since the late 19th century, many Supreme Court precedents have reinforced the so-called plenary power doctrine, which holds that normal constitutional constraints on federal authority largely do not apply to immigration restrictions. For example, a variety of Supreme Court decisions hold that migrants could be excluded based on their political views and based on restrictive laws whose enactment was in large part motivated by racial and ethnic prejudice. But these precedents are not as clear as is often assumed. Many upheld discriminatory immigration restrictions when similar discrimination was also permitted in the domestic context. For example, some involved racially discriminatory restrictions at a time when courts also upheld domestic Jim Crow laws, and others upheld the exclusion of communists at a time when courts permitted domestic persecution of communists as well. Still, in addition to rejecting the reasoning of the travel ban decision, uprooting the plenary power theory entirely would require reconsideration of the traditional interpretations of many earlier precedents, even though it would not require fully overruling those cases. The court could instead accept that those precedents were justifiable insofar as they upheld discrimination that was also considered permissible in other areas of law at the time but reject the idea that they require perpetuation of a double standard between immigration law and other fields. Rejecting that view is the right course. The plenary power doctrine has no basis in the Constitution. It was born of the racial and ethnic bigotry of the late 19th century and deserves to suffer the same fate as Plessy v. Ferguson and other products of that mindset. Abolishing constitutional double standards in immigration law would not end all immigration restrictions, but it would ensure that immigration policy is subject to the same constitutional constraints as other exercises of federal authority. The government could still restrict immigration based on a variety of characteristics. For example, it could still discriminate using such criteria as migrants' education, occupational credentials, and criminal records. But it would no longer be permitted to engage in racial, ethnic, religious, and other discrimination that is forbidden in other contexts. Ending this double standard will not be easy and probably cannot be done by lawyers alone. The civil rights movement, the feminist movement and the gun rights movement are all examples of how successful struggles to strengthen protection for constitutional rights usually require a strategy that integrates litigation and political mobilization. The lessons of that history might be useful to those who seek to end one of the most egregious double standards in our constitutional jurisprudence. Yeah. We're entering the season of dry air in here, and I'm already suffering from it. Anyway, so, uh, so let's look at some examples here. Next article is entitled, U.S. Top Court to Weigh Prohibition on Encouraging Illegal Immigration. Okay. The U.S. Supreme Court on Friday agreed to hear a bid by President Donald Trump's administration to resurrect a federal law that makes it a felony to encourage illegal immigrants to come or stay in the United States after it was struck down by a lower court as a violation of free speech rights. In a case involving a California woman named Evelyn Smith, 
convicted of violating the law, the justices will review a ruling by the San Francisco-based Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals invalidating it for infringing on rights guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment. Okay, uh, editorial aside here. Remember, we're talking about citizens' rights to free speech in this instance, not immigrants' rights to anything, but citizens' rights to say, hey, I encourage people to come here without following the, the rules or whatever. So we're, we're taking even a step away from uh, restricting the rights of immigrants and the Trump administration is wanting to restrict the rights of citizens insofar as they are uh, appealing to aid immigrants. So, something to think about. Okay. Federal prosecutors in 2010 brought charges against Smith, a U.S. citizen who ran an immigration consultancy in San Jose, accusing her of making money by duping illegal migrants into paying her to file frivolous visa applications while remaining in the country indefinitely. Her business primarily served Filipinos who worked as home health care providers. Smith was convicted in 2013 of violating provisions of the decades-old federal law that bar inducing or encouraging an illegal immigrant to come to, enter, or reside in the United States, including for financial gain. She was also convicted of mail fraud and was sentenced to 18 months in prison and three years of supervised release. <clears throat> Losing my voice. The Ninth Circuit in 2018 ruled that the law must be struck down because it is overly broad and criminalizes er even simple speech that is protected by the First Amendment. For instance, a grandmother could theoretically be charged under the law for telling her grandson whose visa has expired, I encourage you to stay, the Ninth Circuit noted. The court begins its next nine-month term on Monday. In Trump administration's appeal to the Supreme Court, Solicitor General Noel Francisco said the law is important to stopping those who enrich themselves by encouraging illegal immigration. The law targets only communication that fosters unlawful activity, which is not protected by the First Amendment, Francisco said in a filing. Smith's lawyers, urging the court to deny the case, argued that the law goes well beyond forbidding speech essential to a crime and covers both criminal and non-criminal immigration infractions. There are better ways to catch wrongdoers, her lawyers said, including provisions barring transporting or harboring illegal migrants. Trump's hardline stance towards immigration, legal and illegal, has been a fundamental part of his presidency and his 2020 re-election bid. So yeah, I'm not arguing to defend Smith here. It sounds like she had a, a, a pretty dodgy business. But to put this law that is that broad out there and say, hey, you know, you can't even incur it. So it's like if I am on the radio here, which oddly I am, and I were to say, hey, you know, I think, you know, Trump's trying to restrict immigration. Just don't worry about it. Come here anyway. Um, you know, you'll find a safe place. I would be guilty of committing a felony for doing that. And um, I don't know. So, moving onwards, here's another one. Um, remember, these are rights based, ordinarily rights that are protected by the Constitution, but be because the I word is somehow involved in it, suddenly these rights are not so right, so much rights anymore because we can't encourage, we can't support, we can't defend immigrants who are coming here. So, <clears throat> pardon me, our next article, U.S. government plans to collect DNA from detained immigrants. The Trump administration is moving to collect DNA samples from hundreds of thousands of people booked into federal immigration custody each year and to enter the results into a national criminal database, an immense expansion of the use of technology to enforce the nation's immigration laws. Senior officials at the Department of Homeland Security said Wednesday that the Justice Department was developing a federal regulation that would give immigration officers the authority to collect DNA. Oh, excuse me. 
<clears throat> That's really painful. To collect DNA in detention facilities across the country that are currently holding more than 40,000 people. The move would funnel thousands of new records to the FBI, whose extensive DNA, data, DNA, DNA database has been limited mainly to genetic markers collected from people who have been arrested, charged, or convicted in connection with serious crimes. There have long been calls to collect immigrant DNA records to help identify criminals who have previously been in immigration custody but may not otherwise be known to the authorities. Congress passed a law authorizing a broad collection of DNA data in 2005, but at the time an exemption was put in place to protect immigrants. A Homeland Security official said in a call with reporters on Wednesday that the exemption was outdated and that it was time to eliminate it. Immigrant and privacy advocates have said the move raised privacy concerns for an already vulnerable population. The new rules would allow the government to collect DNA from children, as well as those who seek asylum at legal points of entry. The advocates warned that the United States citizens, who are sometimes accidentally booked into immigration custody, could also be forced to provide DNA samples. That kind of mass collection alters the purpose of DNA collection from one of criminal investigation, basically, to population surveillance, surveillance, which is basically, there's that word again, contrary to our basic notion. <laughs> okay, sorry. The Vera Eidelman, a staff lawyer, is, is really in love with the word basically. Quote, the, that kind of mass collection alters the purpose of DNA collection from one of criminal investigation, basically, to population surveillance, which is basically contrary to our basic notions of a free, trusting, autonomous society, says Vera Eidelman, a staff lawyer with the American Civil Liberties Union's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. She said that the because genetic material carries family connections, the data collection would have implications not only for those in immigration custody, but also their family members who might be United States citizens or legal residents. Homeland Security officials, of course, said the new initiative was permitted under the DNA Fingerprint Act of 2005. Until now, immigrant detainees have been exempt from the law, they said, because of an agreement between two Obama administration officials, Attorney General Eric Holder and the Homeland Security Secretary Janet DiPolitano. A letter in August to the White House from the Office of Special Counsel cited an official whistleblower complaint alleging that immigration agencies had failed to carry out their full obligations under the law to collect DNA. It suggested that immigration authorities such as Customs and Border Protection already were carrying out limited DNA collections. The agency's noncompliance with the law has allowed subjects subsequently accused of violent crimes, including homicides and sexual assault, to elude detection even when detained multiple times by CBP and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. The officials said the proposed rule was inspired partly by a pilot program conducted this summer along the southwestern border in which ICE agents used rapid DNA sampling technology to identify fraudulent family units, adults who were using children disguised as their own to exploit special protections for families with immigrant children. The new program would differ from the pilot in that it would provide a comprehensive DNA profile of individuals who are tested as opposed to the more narrow test that was used only to determine parentage. And unlike the testing under the pilot program, the results would be shared with other law enforcement agencies. After the DNA samples are taken, they would be entered into the FBI's highly regulated national DNA database, known as CODIS, or Combined DNA Index System, which is used by state and law enforcement authorities to help identify criminal suspects. It is advertised on the Bureau's website as a tool for linking violent crimes. In supplying the FBI and other law enforcement with the DNA of immigration detainees, federal authorities are jumping into an ethical debate about the use of DNA in criminal investigations. While such sampling has been crucial in securing thousands of prosecutions over the past several decades, it has also generated controversy because of the potential for abuse. 
The move comes amid a wider Trump administration push to criminalize unauthorized border crossings, even in some cases when people enter the country lawfully, such as those who present themselves at legal ports of entry to seek asylum. Regarding that group, which is considered protected under federal asylum law, a senior Homeland Security official said Wednesday, there is a criminal aspect to that population. Crossing the border without documents and attempting to elude border authorities is a misdemeanor for first offenders. President Trump has often sought to link all immigrants, regardless of their legal status, to crime, despite a significant body of research that has shown that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than native-born citizens. We don't have, this is a quote, quote, we don't have a statistical database of how many businesses immigrants create or the ways they enrich our communities, said Aaron Murphy, a professor at New York University School of Law, who wrote a book documenting the misuse of forensic evidence in criminal investigations. But if the government has a way to say, this is the number of immigrants we've linked to crimes, and this is something we already see anecdotally, we might lose sight of all the positive benefits. Homeland Security officials who discussed the new initiative said immigration agents would be trained to properly collect the data while respecting immigrants' privacy rights. Oh, of course. Though the Supreme Court has found that the constitutional right to privacy applies to everyone within the United States, regardless of their immigration status, a more restrictive interpretation of the Fourth Amendment has not been applied within a hundred-mile zone of the border where suspicionless searches are allowed even of American citizens. Trump administration officials did not provide a timeline for the rollout of the regulation, but said a working group was meeting weekly to introduce it as soon as possible. So there are a lot of different aspects to that, but the basic point of that is that they want to collect DNA from everybody that they have in detention, regardless of how, of how they ended up in detention or whether they were accused of or committed any crime or had nothing to do with any of that. And then take all that, so it's like an entire population of people, and give all that to the F FBI to include in their criminal database. So all of these people become, by guilt by association, I guess, criminals, or considered criminals, or listed as being in a criminal database because of this. And that is really creepy and really, really disturbing. <clears throat> but there's more. Oh, yes. U.S. government wants to screen immigrants' social media before granting citizenship. Privacy, anyone? Respect? No, no. Not if you want to be a citizen of the United States. If you're born here, hey, you can do what you want. If you're coming over the border, uh, I don't think so. So, immigrants applying for certain benefits may soon be required to provide links to their social media activity as part of the application process. The Department of Homeland Security wants to be able to review information posted on social media over the last five years by immigrants who apply for nine types of benefits, including U.S. citizenship through naturalization, Asylum and changes on permanent residence through marriage, according to a notice published in the Federal Register. U.S. government departments and agencies involved in screening and vetting, to include DHS, identified the collection of social media user identifications, also known as usernames, identifiers, or handles, and associated publicly available social media platforms used by the applicant during the past five years as important for identity verification, immigration, and national security vetting. Ooh. For DHS, these data elements will be added to certain immigration benefit requests or traveler forms where the information was not already collected. Attributing the change to President Trump's Executive Order 13780, there we are again, the Trump cult, which seeks to improve U.S. security by tightening the scrutiny of foreign nationals who want to enter the United States. DHS said it will accept public comment on the proposal until November 4th. If approved, 
DHS will add questions about social networks to several forms used by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. <sighs> the proposed changes are similar sorry, to the State Department's plan to ask foreign citizens applying for immigration... Plan to ask foreign citizens... citizens my voice is wearing out here. The State Department's plan to ask foreign citizens applying for immigrant and non-immigrant visas questions about the social media accounts they have used in the past five years in an effort to improve the screening process. Finally got that out. It is clear that an open-ended inquiry into online presence would give DHS a window into applicants' private lives, a coalition of 28 civil rights and technology groups wrote in a letter in August in opposition to the proposal. Scrutiny of their sensitive or controversial online profiles would lead many visa waiver applicants to self-censor or delete their accounts, with consequences for personal, business, and travel-related activity. The 19 social media networks of interest to USCIS and CBP include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Flickr, LinkedIn, YouTube, Reddit, Tumblr, and Pinterest. Well, <laughs> I'm on YouTube, <laughs> on Facebook, uh, and not any of these others, but um, yeah, uh, you can look at my social media stuff and you can see what I'm thinking about you right now. Uh, USCIS and CBP to proceed. The platforms selected represent those which are among the most popular on a global basis. Uh, you're missing WhatsApp and Line and uh, uh, Signal and uh, oh, there's a bunch of things you're missing out on here. TikTok? Yeah. Those are huge. Anyway, DHS officials already use some information publicly available on social media to determine an applicant's eligibility for an, for an immigration benefit. But until now, the agency had not asked immigrants directly for their social media information in the application process. The DHS notice said that if applicants did not include their social media information on the immigration forms, their requests would not be denied or rejected based solely on the lack of information. Quote, USCIS will continue to adjudicate a form where social media information is not answered, but failure to provide the requested data may either delay or make it impossible for USCIS to determine an individual's eligibility for the requested benefit. In other words, you better give it. So I'm wondering, like, I, I, I read this list, Facebook, okay, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, no, Instagram, no, Flickr, no, LinkedIn, yeah, but I never use it. YouTube, yes. Reddit, no. Tumblr, no. Pinterest. I mean, if I just say no to most of these, they're going to go, oh, well, you're not being forthcoming, and therefore you can't come in. Lucky for me, I'm already a citizen. Anyway, um, the proposal would take effect only after DHS receives federal approval and officially publishes all the form's new versions. Another DHS notice published last week in the Federal Register said immigrants will be required to include their current and past phone numbers and email addresses, as well as other biographical data. So much for the right for privacy. Okay, uh, I have run out of time. I have no more time left. Uh, thank you for listening. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, we will see you sometime with more stories from around the world <laughs> I'm, I'm mixing up my uh, endings here anyway thanks for tuning in we'll see you later bye bye